It's a rainy day out there, folks, but I'm dry here in South Hood Studio. Welcome to episode 46. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker. How's it going? Uh, this is episode 46 of Ego and Vice. My name is Mike, and I am under the weather. Speaking of rain, there's a storm cloud in my brain right now. Somehow, somewhere, I got a cold. And uh, at first, I thought it was just like a sore throat. And I'm like, okay. I think I went to band practice, and I came woke up the next morning. I'm like, ah, maybe I pushed a little hard last night. But then it just crept into my sinuses and up into my into my brain it's in my brain in my throat and i feel like an absolute bag of shit hooray and i don't like taking cold medication because it i don't know it fucks with my other medication and i i just i just power through the man cold if you will so if i get a little whiny in the short time i'm talking to you right now i apologize but i kind of don't because I, this could be the last day of my life i may pass away from this cold from this man cold but anyway, fuck it. Um, yeah, I was supposed to uh, have this uh, episode up a couple days ago, but I was in bed. And I was uh, staring at the ceiling, contemplating existence. And it was a it was a good time. So I woke up this morning. I dragged my, my carcass out of bed. And um, yeah, I cracked open a, a fresh Blue Mountain Coors Light because it's 5 o'clock fucking somewhere, my friends. And it's actually made me feel quite better. Because I'm on the mend. I'm on the mend. So, look out, world. I'm on the mend. Anyway. Um, other than that, I, other than uh, on my being uh, potent, potentially on my deathbed, I haven't been doing much. I did record a nice conversation. That's nice. A nice conversation uh, with um, a friend of mine called, uh, his name is Chris Ward. He's in a band in town uh, called The Rebel Year. Uh, when I was in Hearts and Minds, the band I was in a while ago, um, we played with the Rebel Year. I think a couple times, maybe once. I don't remember. And uh, I've had uh, short conversations with Chris, but he called me up because I put out a, an open um, email. Not an email, like a post. Like, anybody want to be on this fucking show? And a bunch of people got back to me. On Ego and Vice, I mean. A bunch of people got back to me, and Chris was one of them. I'm like, hey, dude, yeah, come on in. And... Uh, so he came in and we had a good conversation. As always on Ego and Vice, we focused on his history and you know his his um, experiences in in local music uh, with the Rebel Year, some of his earlier stuff. We got lots of music that I will play from uh, the life and times of Chris Ward. He also has a new project. It's kind of a solo project. It's called Silent Era Cinema, uh, which is a little bit of a departure from the Rebel Year kind of stuff, but it's really uh, creative and it's kind of rad. It's very rad. So I'm going to play a bunch of that stuff. Um, yeah, so what the fuck, man? Let's uh, just dig right into this episode because it's a really good conversation. And uh, Chris is a really nice guy. And he's well-spoken. And he's got lots to say. And as always, I say on every episode, these people are more interesting than I am. I'm just the vehicle. That's all I am. Anyway. All right. I'm feeling kind of nostalgic. And um, I'm going to play some Hearts and Minds. I'm going to play a song called Run. Because the way I met Chris, the guest of Ego and Vice, episode 46, was through uh, the Rebel Year playing with Hearts and Minds. Cool. So I'm going to play this song. It's called Run. It's off of Hearts and Minds' last record, um, their, their final record, uh, The Dark Season. Uh, on the other side of this song, we're going to come back with Chris Ward. And we're going to talk it out, yo. 
All right, this is uh, Hearts and Minds. This is Run. This is Ego and Vice, episode 46. I think it's fair to say we're all caught in the middle. Two opposing sides that just can't give a little. At each other's throats, we're not solving the riddle. See who burns around you, you're playing the fiddle. Street lights reflecting off the wet cement, shielding your eyes to hide your malcontent. Should you miss a step or stop to catch your breath? Betrayal is true man's put to death. Run, run, run. Can't you see we're falling? Run, falling faster than we'll ever fly. Run, so we just walk around our whole lives blind. Reflecting off the wet cement Shielding your eyes To hide your malcontent Should you miss a step Or stop to catch your breath A traitor lives True man's put to death Straight into this uh, conversation with uh, my friend Chris Ward, Hi. who is in Southhood Studio. Uh, as you heard in the intro, he is part of a uh, band that's been around for a long time called The Rebel Year. Correct. And he also has a new uh, project uh, coming out that is called Silent Era Cinema. Correct. That's very interesting. Chris, how are you? 
I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Thanks for coming out. I always appreciate when people come down to South Hood, and uh, here we are. So we might as well fucking make the best of it. Absolutely. So uh, what have you been up to? What the hell's going on? Um. Well, I mean... Music wise, um, just been working on this new project, Silent Era Cinema. I started, uh, I guess it would have been last year, mid last year. I, I kind of got the idea to start uh, start writing some tunes in my basement, much like yourself here. I have uh, I have a little basement studio at my place. It, do, um, would, would, would we call this a studio? Sure. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It looks somewhat similar to mine. So. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very um, much. And uh, I just started working on some some new tunes, some new ideas. I had, uh, um, as you you know, as you noted, so I'm in the Rebel year as well, which uh, we were around sort of mid 2000s, I guess. And then we took a 10 year hiatus and then got got back together in 2017. God damn. Yeah. But um. Um. Like, not to cut you off. No, no. But before we get ahead of ourselves, my intro question went in too far into the podcast. We're too okay. far ahead. Okay. Rewind. Let's, let's back this shit up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've played together before. Yeah. And you had just mentioned something off air that my old band, Our Mistake, we played together. Maybe it wasn't the Rebel Year. No, I can't remember what band I was in at the time, but we did play. It might have even been, there was a period of a couple of years where I did a solo thing and had a band. Okay. So it was, it was, I don't know, Chris Ward band, I guess. Cool. But Let's back it up even further. Where, sure. Who are you? What's going on here? <laughs> where are you from? Like, how long have you been playing music? I'm from Ottawa, uh, born and raised, uh, with the exception of a couple of years that I, I lived in Montreal. But, um, and I've been playing music since, oh, it would have been 97. So it all started, this is the big story, it all started when I saw a music video by Oasis. Okay. Um, for the song, do you know what I mean? And I watched them play as all these helicopters were flying around them, and I thought, yeah, that's it, that's it. I think I was fourteen at the time, and I was like, this is this is what I have to do. Ah, oh, the nineties. Yeah. And so I remember buying. I went out and I bought. Um, I asked my dad for a guitar, and the deal was, was I fourteen or fifteen? Because I think I already had a job at that point. But the deal was, he would buy the guitar, but I had to buy my own amp. Okay. So we went down to Steve's. That's, on that's uh where's steve's king edward no uh, uh rito rito, rito yeah. king edward uh we went down to steve's and he picked up the guitar which was a yamaha pacifica okay and i bought myself a nice little pv ray amp. i still have a pv amp <laughs> do you and yeah it's it's a it's just a combo but yeah. i love it I oh don't it's give great a shit. they're great they're little yeah. they're little kickboxes right and so and that's how it all started and i put together my first band right in high school and you know i had mentioned to you off air like I've been playing in Ottawa ever since. I played defunct places like Molly Maguire's when I was, I think we were 16 when we played Molly Maguire's. And it was really funny because we all had those giant X's on our hands. Of course. And as soon as we finished the last song, I just remember the bouncers being there and they were like, you got to go. Like, just pack your stuff. You got to get out of here right now. You're not even allowed to be in here. Uh, Molly Maguire's, uh, my old band, when I first got to Ottawa, the band that I actually moved from Thunder Bay to um, Ottawa for, it was called I Refuse. It was just this three-piece punk band. And one of the first places, we played Zaphods, but one of the first places we played was Molly Maguire's. Yeah. Uh, my sa- Yeah, Molly Maguire's. What the fuck? I just had a brain fart. But anyway, yeah, Molly Maguire's. And I remember that place, and I still have... There's that camera right there beside my PS2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have like D div- like little digital videotapes of us playing at Molly McGuire's and like they had that makeshift stage and yep. I literally went through the stage like my f- leg oh, went Jesus. through the stage yeah. and played there. But that was a rad kind of punk it bar. Was. It was cool. It you was know cool. what I mean? It was like an Irish pub. Yeah. But they brought in a lot of great bands and stuff and that was another place in Ottawa to play. Mhm. Absolutely. Which is dwindling over the years, of course. Of course. As you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's and that's and I don't know, man. Like, I mean, that's that's where I've been. Like, I've I've just been kind of steadily playing and writing music in various projects. Played, I I played Barrymore's, you know, um, Zaphods. Oh my god, played Zaphods more times than I can remember. Do you remember Zaphods two? No. Okay. So I did. I never got to play Zaphods two. Uh, we did play. I'm trying to think, man. I can't, I can't even remember. We did play the, I think it was called the Whipping Post or something like that. Mm-hmm. I feel like we played there. We played the old Underground, which is, of course, now House of Targ. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and so, I don't know. I've, I've always just kind of been on the go doing my own thing. And, uh, you know, and then 
in 2006 or five, um, Montreal became the hotspot for music in Canada. Sure. You know, and uh, I moved down there to try and, you know, make it, quote unquote, make it. Yeah, don't we all try that, right? <laughs> so so it's what, a tough couple when, of years. When you started, you said your dad bought you a guitar and you had your PV Bandit or your PV Rage. What, Rage, PV, PV Rage. Rage cool. yeah. um, have you always uh, been a guitar player? Um, yeah. Uh, in the Rebel year, and I swear to God, I'm, my brain is like nuts because I'm old. Um, <laughs> Chris said to me, he's like, I'm 35. And I'm like, well, I'm 44. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like... Okay, yeah, so we both have like some deficiencies, but I have yeah. more. Um ha- have you always been uh do you do you do vocals as well? Yeah. Yeah, so I I actually took up vocals when I was 14 in, you know, in this high school band I was in when I was 14 um out of necessity. We we wanted to play a high school showcase and nobody wanted to sing. So we were a five-piece band of guys, <laughs> nobody wanting to sing. Isn't that just So al- I stepped up. Isn't that just always the story? It's like yeah. nobody wants to sing. Everybody wants to like play the drums yeah. or play guitar. And it's like, who's going to sing? Well, I don't yeah. want to sing. I can't sing. <laughs> that was the same thing that happened to me. It was just like, I didn't want to be a singer, nope. but I didn't play guitar at the time. They're like, you sing, fine, yeah. I'll sing. Yeah. So I sang horribly. Well, I still do, but you know, well, same here. So it's yeah. you know, it's been an it's with the vocals, it's been an uphill climb. But things got better when I took some lessons. Oh, those, you, actually, those, you actually took vocal lessons. Yeah, oh, cool. yeah. Those those it's fun. It's funny, you know, because the music. I always find too like so when you're younger, the music may not sound the greatest because mm. you're rough around the edges. But those are some great times, mm. and I and I find that gets lost as you. I think as you become more serious in music, you sometimes forget about how much fun you're supposed to be having. So I had some really like my vocal coach when I was 16, it was at the folklore center. She was fucking nuts. This woman was crazy. But I remember I was with her for like two years and towards the end of the two years, I wasn't having fun in my other band anymore. Mm. But you know how it goes. It's like, that's your band and you can't just like quit your band and you've already got like an album out and things are, you know, they're okay. And I remember going down to see her and I was like, I, I just, she, she just looked at me and was like, are you having fun in your band? And I was like, no. And she's like, then quit. And I quit. And she, <laughs> it, like, it was just, so the thanks very, teach. Yeah. <laughs> she, and it was funny. Cause I had, I hadn't written, I remember this. I hadn't written a song in months and it was really bothering me. And she was like, I bet you when you quit, you'll write like four or five songs. And I quit and I wrote, I wrote more than that. I remember I wrote like, I think 10 or 12. Just Like just inspired from the experience or, yeah. or just, yeah. Okay. Just being, just being free of the band that I was in that I wasn't really having fun in anymore, you know? Fair enough. And I yeah. guess on paper, of course, like lessons, uh, whether you play an instrument, whether you play guitar, uh, whether you play drums, bass, whatever, keyboard, piano, whatever, lessons will obviously make you better did you actually take a lot from the lessons that you still use today that improved where you are absolutely um it's funny and how so well it's funny because i so i play guitar i can play bass like in in various bands i've played guitar bass a little bit of drums and and keyboards and when it comes to instruments i'm all self-taught i tried guitar lessons for maybe Oh man, three months and I, I just couldn't take it anymore. But when it came to vocals, I thought to myself, to if I want to be a decent singer, I I need to know all those little tricks, you know? Mm. And so I remember the first thing she showed me, she sat down, we did a scale together. And she's like, Great, you're not tone deaf, so I can I can teach you, right? So I learned she taught me how to breathe properly when you're singing like through your diaphragm which i still use to this day um she showed me how to phrase your lyrics like one of the things i really liked about this teacher in particular was we worked on my stuff okay we didn't we didn't learn some other song like i would bring her my stuff i would sing her the melodies and she had this great ear she could just pick it up on piano and start playing and then we would literally sit there and go through my songs line by line and she would show me how to sing those you know so that you know, and it's, it's, you know, you were saying how, so it's like, it's things I can pick up when I hear other people sing, right? So like breathing through your diaphragm properly allows you, for example, at the end of a really long note, a lot of people, when they don't use their diaphragm, they have the tendency to fall flat mm-hmm. right on the note. But if you're pushing out air properly and you're really holding that note, you can hold that note for quite a while, right? Damn. So those are things that I, I, I've, you know. And it must have worked because I've had people, I've had other musicians in, in the bands I've been in that say one of my strengths as a as a songwriter is my ability to write a melody mm. and be able to hold notes when needed and like and know when to 
you know, cut words out or that kind of thing. Do you want to give a shout out to that teacher? Um, oh, he I don't even remember her name. <laughs> it's really funny. I Make don't remember up. her name. Make something up. Mary Zadra. Mary Zadra. That's her actual name. Is that her name? That is her name. Is she still out there somewhere? She's got to be. I don't know. She All was right. at the. It's funny because she was at the folklore center for quite a while. Because I, I, I bumped into a friend who was doing, who was a teacher there. I mean, again, this was years ago, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, Mary, she's still there." So, oh, good. I don't know. I mean, I know the store is not there. Maybe she hung on to the end. I don't know. I don't know. Well, good for her, and <laughs> yeah. uh, she was an influence in your life, Absolutely. or in your in your rock stardom. Yeah, well, yeah. Before you went to Montreal to try and make, make it, it. <laughs> it was to try and make it. Yeah, well, that's cool. Um, so when you went to Montreal, uh, you said you were there for about a year and a bit. You just went there solely for music, or yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had secured like a, a little part-time job okay. um, to help me, you know, pay some bills. Um, I also was was fortunate enough to live with my grandma, oh. so that was very rock and keeping roll. Keeping it too. real, keeping <laughs> it real. Hey and, man, uh, did yeah. uh, did anyone that you were playing in in Ottawa with go with you, or you went down there nope. solely by yourself, yep. saying I'm gonna? Did you go down there as like I'm just gonna do some solo stuff or some acoustic stuff, or I'm gonna go down there, I'm gonna meet some people, get incorporated in the scene, start a band, and see where it goes? Well, see, so I'm a planner, so I always I always plan ahead, and it's it's more the latter. So if you remember, and again here here I am aging myself. You remember MP3.com? Of course. And so I had found uh, so I was really into Brit rock, right? Brit pop, Brit rock, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I had found this band called Brighton from Montreal. Mm-hmm. And I I loved their stuff. I've absolutely loved their stuff. And so I kept in touch with the singer Nathan, who's still a pretty good friend of mine right now. Mm-hmm. And I remember messaging him, be like, Oh, your band rocks. Da, da, da. It all lined up that I got out of university and his band was kind of they were rejigging their lineup. They wanted to change some things around and uh, they needed a keys player, keyboard player. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really know too much about playing keys other than what I had taught myself. And I had uh, I had bought myself a piano, or like an electric piano, whatever. And uh, he was basically like, "Yeah, like, do you want to come down and play keys for us and move to Montreal and play keys?" And I mean, I was like, "Sure, yeah, let's do it." Yeah. So that's kind of why I went down there initially. Um, and then you know, during my time there, I also did solo shows too. On top of that, and I, uh, the nice thing with Montreal too is you're fairly close to New York City. So I was going to New York back and forth quite a bit mm-hmm. and uh, and and playing some open mics, things like that. But yeah, originally it was to join uh, this band Brighton, which we later, I think we renamed ourselves uh, Acrobat. And um, yeah, so I played with them for a while. And they're still, the guys are still friends of mine too. So that's great. Yeah, you make a lot of uh, connections in, in music, whether it be um, in Ottawa or Montreal, because we're all kind of after the same goal, I suppose. Yeah. And even if it's not a goal of making it, it's just, you know, peers and everybody loves to do what they do and you love writing music and it's kind of a passion. So you just keep following it. Right. Absolutely. Whether it be in Ottawa and Montreal is an easy move from Ottawa because it's just like if your whole family's in Ottawa and you move to Montreal, something drastic happens. I'll be there in an hour and a half. Boom. You know what I mean? So it's cool. Yeah. I love Montreal. I have uh, some good friends up there in a band called the whiskey chase, um, Nick and Johnny and Nico. Hi guys. (laughs) How's it going? Yeah. We go up there all the time and, um, it's really amazing how close Ottawa and Montreal are together, like, uh, close to each other. Mm-hmm. And Ottawa scene is, I love the Ottawa scene, Absolutely. but you yeah. go to the Montreal scene and it's just a different kind of electric, you know what I mean? Yep. So you can kind of spread your wild oats that way. Absolutely. So, awesome, dude. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that was a good opening segment. Sure. Do you have anything... You sent me a couple of songs from your new projects, and yep. I also have some songs from the Rebel Year. Sure. But... Do you think you could find something? Did you record anything with your bands, like those early bands? I always like to play something hmm. like the progression of like, who is this guy? This is where he started and this is where he ends up. Hmm. I there- don't I don't have anything that isn't on a CD. I okay. have I have CDs. I can I can maybe do some digging around for you. Maybe even like dump it onto uh do are you a Mac or PC guy? Yeah, I'm a Mac guy. Oh yeah, just fucking throw it in there and it'll just <laughs> automatically like uh integrate uh, or associate with like iTunes. Yeah. And then send me something. Sure. And then we'll play a song right now. Okay. We have no idea what it's gonna be. We don't know. All right. <laughs> this is Chris Ward from the early days. Hopefully uh, he can send me something. All right, <laughs> this is Ego and Vice, number, uh, episode number 46.
So that was Chris Ward in an early incarnation of something. What the hell was that? A young man's rock and roll, you know? Yeah, well, I thought it was, I thought it was great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, let's talk about the Rebel Year. Yeah. Because um, that's how I know you. That's how we met. Uh, I think the first time we ever met, that I ever met you, was mm-hmm. at um, uh, the Rainbow, Rainbow when Game. you played with Hearts and Minds last yep. December. Last December. But I'm sure the Rebel Year goes back farther than that. We do. We go back to 2007 when I moved back from Montreal. So I came back to Ottawa, had all of these songs that I had written in Montreal, uh, needed a band, tried to set up the solo thing again that I had going on, wasn't really having it, kind of fell apart, kept the drummer from the solo thing, asked at the time three other guys, four other guys, and that's how the Rebel Year came to be. We were known for having... um, like. When you and I played in December, we're, we're back to a four-piece now. But back in 2007, we were a five-piece with three electric guitars. Wow. Which used to cause a lot of sound men, um, used to be their uh, the bane of their existence at our shows. That's like... The, trying to mic three amps. That's like <laughs> the Foo Fighters. Yes, like the current Foo Fighters lineup. The Foo but, Fighters, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it, it honestly, the Rebel Year is probably one of the only bands I've been in where it just, everything just happened really easy and naturally how did you guys uh all get together and what's the rebel year what does that mean so the rebel year is a nod to my year and a bit that i spent in montreal okay. you know trying to make it we keep using air quotes um <laughs> which nobody can see <laughs> nobody can see make it they can feel them. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know honestly I, I i had all these songs i wanted to start another band and i asked um a friend of mine dan who's been a you know he's he's a guitar player and he's been in several of my projects and then from there, we asked his friend, John. Um, I had my buddy, Max, who was uh, the drummer in all my solo stuff. And who else did we ask? There was a couple of guys at the quote-unquote like quote third guitar position that uh, there was, it was a bit of a revolving door until my buddy Dave stepped in. So it was all friends of mine that I knew, and, and we just, it was great. I, all I remember about that band is by Jam 2, even though we hadn't solidified the third guitar position yet, we had like six songs done it was crazy how fast we wrote it just chemistry was there right yeah um was the third guitar like a like a planned thing or you just didn't yep you you just felt bad about like saying okay whoops no it it, it had to be it had to be louder (laughs) had to be louder than everything and and i it was always planned i remember i told that to, to dan the the i guess the second guitar player and i said i want three guitars and i and and he was like why you know and i was like i just really want it to be really loud and that did it? And and from your vision, did it work out? Like absolutely. You, you said that uh, uh, when a sound guy was just like, oh Jesus Christ, I'm yeah. Like, I'm but when it came to like the writing process, the three guitars was very functional. It was like exactly yep. what you were looking for. Yeah, I mean, we've always we always had really smart musicians in that band. Like it's it's you know, um, we had a couple of lineup changes, and we really hit our stride when um, we brought in these two brothers. Uh, so Alex on drums and then Sam on the thir- in the third guitar position. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Dan is a great guitar player. Alex is a fantastic drummer. Sam's a great guitar player and John is an incredible bass player. So it, it all just, it all just fit. And in fact, what was neat was having the three guitars really let us, um, it let us go creatively. You know, you didn't have to fit in that mold. I can just keep a rhythm going and let those two other guys just, just do their thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and those were really fun times. Like we played, we did some shows with the Arkells. We did some shows with the stills. We played blues fest that year. And it's 2009, the year kiss came. Um, Oh man. Gene Simmons. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I stayed for two songs and then got the hell out of there, but uh, douchebag. Anyway, yeah, no, I I share that uh, that uh, same as you, but that's that's what happened. It was great. It was a fantastic band to be in. Um, I you know, and then we broke up. <clears throat> I was gonna say, um, how long did that uh, that formation of the band last? Because before we get to the ten year hiatus, yeah, let's uh, let's kind of like milk this dry. Yeah, so that formation lasted about a year and a half. Okay. Yeah, because the the band was was together for about two and a half years. The first formation lasted about like, you know, I don't know, like almost a year. And then the second one was about a year and a half. Yeah. We had this really sweet gig in Toronto playing the uh, Mod Club Theater. Mm-hmm. Um, like it was great. 
I, I had a blast with those guys still do, you know, when we, when we do get to, when we do get together, but we played blues fest and then we broke up. What, well, how come, <laughs> what happened? Uh, you know, I think it's like anything else, right? <clears throat> you know, you start, um, I don't know if like complacent is the right word, but you start kind of getting bored and then you start looking at other things. And I remember, you know, some of the guys were starting another project with somebody else. And then, you know, it's like, okay. And, and I think, you know, it's funny cause one of the pieces of advice I got from my buddy Max at the time was whatever you do, like, even if you have to retool, find new guys, whatever, he's like, don't give up the name because you've already been building it up. And it's the only band I've ever been in where... Well, it's your brand, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's the only band I've ever been in where I, it got to the point where I wasn't really booking shows anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, people were emailing us to go play in Toronto or emailing us to go play in Montreal and... uh you know, when you're young though, and you're you make uh, rash decisions. When the band broke up, I was like, "Fuck that man! Fuck the Rebel Year! I don't care anymore." Mm. Went started some new bands, like that kind of thing. And looking back, I mean, maybe I should have just kept the name and kept and kept going. But mm-hmm. you know, here we are, ten years later, right? And uh, during that first uh, incarnation, mm-hmm. is that the right word? Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the influence to uh, when you were writing your songs and stuff? I know, like you grew up with a. Uh, your first thing was Oasis. Yeah. And uh, when you had that band, which lasted a a good chunk of time, like Mm -hmm. how did you, like what was your influence to write? Um, Would you listen to something and be like, okay, or was it just all, especially three guitars, like that must've been like a, like an elaborate kind of process. Yeah. Well, at least at the start for the, for a good chunk of time, it would always be me writing the songs. And then I would bring the sort of, you know, like the shells, if you will, of the songs to jam. And then we'd hash out all the parts Um, towards the end actually though you know on our last ep there was um like some songs credited to me one to our bass player one to our uh, guitarist dan so like and even after that ep like everyone was bringing tunes in for myself i mean you know that's like your mid-20s that's those are tough times Mm. so it wasn't necessarily even what i was listening to it was like i think just all the shit i was going through at the time too right you know you tend to go through a lot of shit in your 20s yeah. whether it's real or not exactly <laughs> real or perceived shit or perceived fucking bullshit yeah so but yeah but it, it leads to a lot of material and what what were the songs about um i think they were they were about you know trying to uh well obviously relationship stuff girl stuff right at the time you know love um but there's there's some stuff too you know, I mean, I was pretty angsty when it came to politics. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a political guy. I speak out on stuff, and uh, there was a lot of tunes too that had to do with sort of politics, the state of the world. Um, you know, that was still somewhat close to like 9/11. So you still had George mm. Bush in there, really, really making shit. Well, we thought making shit bad at the time. I was gonna say, <laughs> so poor, poor George. I take now, George eh? back. Yeah, yeah but fucking George. But uh, so it was a mix of a lot of things. But I think a lot of it just boiled down to your early to mid twenties angst, man, just wanting to write some shit and, you know, um, make an impact, make a difference, you know, for, for what it was at the time. And you were, um, I know you said that you all collaborated, but when it came to songwriting, you were kind of like the sole guy who, like you said, you'd bring in the shell of the song. (laughs) Were you the sole lyricist? Like your, the ideas, like the, the, the point of the song would come across out of your brain type of idea or would everyone just kind of well at the start for sure like that's how it absolutely was at the start Mm because a lot of the a lot of the early stuff in the rebel year was was stuff i had written for my solo project and then it just kind of i was like well i don't want it to be a solo project Mm -hmm. uh in fact the band for a little while we had it kind of set up um we had it set up sort of nine inch nail style where it was a band but i was the main guy so i spent all the money but i also you know, sort of reaped all the benefits, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but towards the end of like, I would say like 2008, 2009, it was very much a collaborative thing where um, I think with the exception of one tune, I still wrote all the lyrics and the melodies, but in terms of the actual music, uh, it definitely became more of, of a band thing. A collective. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. Um, when the band uh, broke up and you said like, okay that's fuck fuck rebel year fuck this fuck that whatever uh was it a hard transition to go into something else or you were just done with it at the time i was done with it at the time okay so i had a i had a friend of mine um charles and i started a band uh called right by midnight before we get into that though, yeah okay yeah this is a whole different conversation (laughs) it is yeah let's play something from 
Do you, you have some recordings from the early, from the first? Uh, yep. All right. Of the Rebel Year? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Is there a song you want to play? Off the early stuff? Yeah. Let's just to give play. Just to give the audience, the audience. There's yeah. the air quotes again. <laughs> Jesus <air> Christ. <laughs> something, yeah. something to kind of relate to? Absolutely. So we'll do a song. We'll do the first song off the first EP. It's called Union Station. Union Station. And I wrote it when I was sitting with my acoustic guitar in Union Station in Toronto. Nice. Yeah. All right. So this is the Rebel Year, the first half of the Rebel Year. Three guitars in this fucking track? Yep. This is Union Station from the Rebel Year. Uh, this is episode 46. I'm with Chris Ward. This is Eagle and Vice.
Shit, man, that was great. That was Union Station by the Rebel Year. Chris yep. Ward is in Southwood Studio. Um, we had talked right before that song came on that you guys broke up mm-hmm. and then you started a long, long <laughs> ten year hiatus. Yes. What the fuck did you do? I did a few different things. So I was in a band called uh Right by Midnight for a couple of years with my friend Charles. Um, also a great band, had a lot of really killer memories of that, of that band too. Um, one of the few bands where we actually did go out on the road, uh, you know, for weeks at a time, sleeping in a van, that kind of thing. It's terrible. Yeah. It's not as cracked up as it's, uh, as it appears, you know, it's fun when you're a kid yeah. and it's just like, fuck it. Yeah. But yeah, the older you get and then it's just like, I just want to go home. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like then, as much as I love the road, I fucking hate the road. Yeah, yeah. and then that band was instrumental in in my you know career because it it actually showed me um, that maybe it's not that I didn't want to do music full time for the rest of my life, but we had the uh, we had the displeasure of playing the big money shot. Oh God! And that uh, that uh, that was a big impetus in. Um, it was part of the reason that that project broke up. It was uh, not a good time. And we got sent to, so we made it pretty far in one of the years. Mm-hmm. And we got sent to Toronto to work with a Juno award winning producer. Okay. On our own dime, of course. And um, all I remember about that is Charles had written a really great song. And we were, we'd rehearsed it and we, we really, we had demoed it. We really liked the way it sound. Charles had all these great like guitar parts and there was like these really killer melodies. And then we get down to Toronto and our producer starts showing us Rihanna videos and starts talking about and the other thing too about Right by Midnight is we had an absolutely incredible drummer, this kid James. One of my all time favorite drummers that I've jammed with. What about James? Yep. And he um this producer decided that all James would do in the verses was just mash the like the toms, you know, like this, like pop, sure. pop, pop, pop. And then uh, in the chorus, he just wanted him to do that sort of syncopated there, like that. The hats to the snare. Waste of talent. And I just remember getting in my car at three o'clock in the morning to drive back to Ottawa after being in the studio for like 14 hours and watching Rihanna videos and thinking to myself, like, maybe I don't want to do this. If this, if, if what just happened is what I need to do to make it, then maybe this isn't really my, uh, my calling. No, I gotcha. I gotcha. That like, was a, I yeah. can't talk bad about Live Eighty Eight Five because I used to work for them. Oh no! no it, well, this was just the contest. Yes, the- <laughs> but the big money shot. Go to entered it a couple times just to see like where we could go with it, and I did something in, like a solo project and stuff like that. And I have friends that work for Eighty Eight Five. I don't like the big money shot solely for the idea. It's almost like an American Idol thing. It's yeah. just like <clears throat> you go like on American Idol and if you sing, if you're like if you don't sound like Rihanna, like yeah. you said, it's just like you're the worst singer I've ever heard in my life. No, no. Yeah. Like and, and there's been all that shit said, but like what if Bob Dylan fucking um auditioned for American Idol or like Tom Petty or like Absolutely. you know what I mean? And it's just like you are the worst singer I've ever it's like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. And it's just like if you're in music literally to sell shoes, then don't be in music. That's it. Man, I've spent my entire life making music because i want to fucking do it for myself Mm -hmm. and i want to play i don't care if i play i'd love to play wembley stadium yeah (laughs) but if i don't care if i ever play wembley stadium if i just play like fucking uh mavericks or cafe de cuff or like the bovine sex club in toronto and there's like 30 40 kids in front of me like jumping around enjoying what i do that's what it's about to me absolutely yeah so when they start like breaking it down Mm -hmm. it's like you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do this to make it it's just like no no No, no, yeah. I don't have to do that. Well, and that's and what I'm, it was. I'm yeah. very passionate about that too. Absolutely. Especially at 44 years old where I'm still playing music, still playing punk rock. Mm-hmm. It's not about fucking selling shoes. It's not about fucking being on the radio to me. No, absolutely. It's yeah. about I'm still playing music and I still love doing it and people are still out there and I'm still expressing myself making art, mm-hmm. if you want to call it that, yeah. loosely. <laughs> But I'm still doing it, and I love it. You know what I mean? And I hate all that 
fucking shit. Yep. And I know it's cliche to say that, like, fucking fuck the, fuck the record companies. But what is a record company nowadays? Oh, well, yeah. What was a record company even back then, right? It was like a, I was, I was, yeah. I was really happy for like, uh, and, and even grateful for the experience. Um, you know, I had, I had, um, you know, I wouldn't say I had a great time in, in the competition, but you know, it was always fun. The one thing I did like about it was it really forced you as a band to have your, your shit together, which a lot of bands n- never really truly do. But you know, at the end of the day for me, it was a big turning point. Cause I just kind of thought to myself, this isn't what I want to do. I just want to make music. I don't want to be Rihanna. You know? Yeah. So for that's me, what it was. for being the big money shot was the, 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 the golden goose out of that or the golden egg was the money. Mm-hmm. Give me some fucking money. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I can go off and do something else. Yeah. Cause I was in a band called hearts and minds, yep. uh, but I wasn't in the band at this time, but they actually were, went kind of through, they were like, they play second behind, um, Jeez, I don't even fucking know. But they won like 40 grand or something like that. And it was just like that 40 grand would have went really far in my independent music career. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? But it wasn't the be all end all of, of, of what music is, no. you know? And I don't know. I just, who cares? Who, gives a, who gives a fuck? You yeah. know? And we won the big money shot. It's like, so? Yeah. So? Well, not only that, but it was funny because wh- I didn't want to enter it, but uh, our guitar player really wanted to enter it. And I remember thinking in my head, you know, I don't want this to become something that ends up breaking up the band. And I, I don't think it was the sole reason why right by midnight broke up, but I think it had a part, it had a part in it. You know, it was the idea that it, it's, I think it cements in some people's heads. This is what I want to do to make it. I want to do this. I'll mm. be Rihanna. But in, and then in my head, it was like, well, I don't want to do that. If making it means that I basically, I hate using the word sell out, but if, if making it means that I've got to sell out and sell my soul, then you can keep the 40 grand yeah. I mean, as nice as it would be. And I'll just keep doing my own thing. Like it's important. It's, it's very yeah. important. It's very yeah. important in any, in any type of like art performance art or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, you succumb to something like, Oh, you, you here, we'll give you this much amount of money, but you have to do it this way. Yeah. And this is the way we think you should do it. Mm-hmm. Even Absolutely. though be like six months ago, you didn't even know who we were. But because we kind of like we we like your sound or something like that, do it this way, and we promise you you're going to get this. It's just like what you're offering me. Yeah, money's fucking awesome. I love money. Yeah, uh, goods and services. I enjoy purchasing <laughs> goods and services. But it's just like fuck you. I'm not going to fucking no. I'm not no. no. And I'm not impressed by that shit. You know no. what I mean? So what? You want a contest? I yeah. don't care. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. If if winning a contest is like the end game is like now we now we gave you this much stuff you have to do it this way mm-hmm. because this is what we think you're this is what we want you to do it's just like this is not worth it yeah because how do you sleep at night being an artist no you're, that's it you've yeah. been playing music for 20 years you're an artist you yeah. you write music like making it here they go again <laughs> air quotes <laughs> it's not worth it man just no. do what you want to do and you Absolutely. never know what's going to happen and that's the beauty of nowadays to do today with like the computer like the computer Mm -hmm. the internet you know you can do whatever you want to do and who knows who knows what's going to happen and if making it is selling a fucking million records which is which is impossible nowadays or making it is just fucking still doing it and going to sleep at night going yeah that was a great fucking show in front of 20 people tonight yeah i'm gonna play with my kids tomorrow yeah that's making it isn't that's, it? That's that's what it is now. That's the reality <laughs> that's of it. That's the reality now, yeah. So no, that's you know, and and that's kind of what happened to that band. Like we just um we kinda you know, and it's unfortunate because we we broke up. We broke up. Man, I have some great like breakup stories or breakup timing stories. We broke up the day our album was released. Yeah. We 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 had uh we had been jamming the night before the album release and there was a huge blowout. And so the album comes out on, you know, like iTunes and in like, you remember the old CD warehouse stuff like that. Sure. And uh, we were no longer a band. <laughs> Damn. So, so I've got boxes of CDs, man. That's how that's how Right by Midnight broke up. Like it was unfortunate, man. Our mistake, actually, that's we have a I have a kind of similar story uh, that that CD right there on the wall. It's yeah. called Sleeping with the Kill Squad. We got it back from he- Healy Disc or some shit. Yeah. And we had like 500 copies and we broke up like 
a month afterwards and i still literally in my back room have about five boxes like full of that cd yeah. <laughs> it's like oh, oh well the amount of money that uh, they get spent on that yeah. but no uh, i was in a band and i'm not going to say any names but i remember i was in a band and i was at a band practice and we were playing something and and somebody said one of the members said because the song went longer than three minutes or some bullshit mm-hmm. and i said why don't we just like fucking just go with it and just play it and he's like uh i'm in this to make money and that's not gonna make us money and that was a kind of like stepping stone to me just being like i don't want to be in this band anymore yeah absolutely yeah because if you're writing songs at three minutes just to make the radio the fucking radio yeah like think about that the radio yeah anyway and my 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 opinion is always if the song is good enough then the radio will play it beyond three minutes and 15 seconds. Yeah, I guess so. But fuck the radio. Just do it for you. Yeah. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. people are going to hear it regardless. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and you know what's funny? Just to, to end my my story about Right by Midnight was we got back and we heard the, the final mix and we hated it. I remember our guitarist tried to email the station to be like, don't play it. We don't like it. And but the as part of the competition, you not only had to play it at your live shows, you had to agree to play it at live shows. Um, you had to. They posted a video of it on YouTube, like sort of a streaming thing. Mm-hmm. Man, it ended up getting a ton of hits. And oh. then I was having, I was having people that I knew email me and go, "I just heard your band on Live eighty five. I love that fucking song." And I'm going, "Are you insane?" <laughs> it's like, like that's the one song. Like it, it's and it wasn't that it was a bad song, but it was that it really wasn't us that's that's why i think it was at the end of the day the the original version we had of that song that charles had wrote was was infinitely better than when this producer got his hands on it and just like tore it to pieces and right you know i remember at one point he he was pleading with us to scream something he wanted there was like this big ending that he had built up and then he wanted one of us to yell out something something crazy over top like i'm going on holiday or something like that <laughs> i just oh man and I remember when he said it, all I did was facepalm. I was like, oh, my God, what's going <laughs> I on? I facepalm myself. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's mm-hmm. that's the story of that band, man. You know, so. That's cool. Yeah. So after 10 years, yep. 10 long years, the Rebel Gear is back together. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know if they're still together. We're on but, a, another hiatus. Yeah, okay. But they got back together. We you did. got back together. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how did that come about? So after Right by Midnight, I was in a brief project with my sister called By the Lights. Um, it, it went about a year or whatever. And um, we, so after, you know, and then it kind of, that kind of fizzled out. And I was, uh, I was in the, I was in the dreaded cover band. I oh. imagine you make some money at least. Yeah. Well, that's okay. It, I, yeah. I that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So I did a cover, the cover band for a while with, with some guys that I'd met. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. About the cover songs? Yeah. Um. Even though you're local musicians, mm-hmm. do you consider cover bands local music? Um, no, I don't either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, um, proceed. Um, yeah, I, just, I, was just, <laughs> no, I was just curious. No. I was just curious. No, I, I, I definitely, I, I don't. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't like when people are in cover bands, even though they're local musicians, yet they'd still try and be like, "We're part of the local scene." Yeah, you're no, not. It's, you're it's, not. It's a separate scene, right? I think it it's, it's, it's their own scene, right? Yeah. Um, so I've been doing that for a little while and I remember we did a show, uh, I think we did a show at, uh, oh man, some bar in Lincoln Fields. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting out of that bar and I remember my wife had come in a separate car cause she, she was doing something before the show and we were driving back to, to our place and I phoned her and I said to her, how did I go from playing blues fest and opening for the Arkells and the stills? to this <laughs> you know like how did this happen over the last say eight or nine years and it was her she just um you know she just said listen why don't you just email the guys in the rebel year it's been 10 years um you know we had done like a little reunion show in the midst but like and she was like just email them and ask them if they want to be a band again yeah. and that's how it came to be i just i sent an email to dan our guitar player and I just said, listen, this is going to sound crazy, but like, do you want to get back together and do it, you know, relatively, I won't say full time, but make it like a sort of, this is like a project. Like we're going to get this band back up on the rails yeah. 
do shows again, do the promo picks, like, you know, be a real band as much as we, as we can be a real band. Yeah. And then he said, yeah, right away. We emailed John, got Alex on board and now we're down to four piece. So it's no longer the three guitar. Attack. I know, I know, but, uh, bummer. but, um, <laughs> it's still really loud. <laughs> okay. It's still insanely loud. And that's, that's how it, it just was a series of emails and it was weird. You know, you get back in, we got back in the room together and it was like, well, okay. Like, you know, this is for real, well, you know, for real, but, uh, for reals, for reals. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't know. We hit it off right away. Like I think we jammed on two or three of the old tunes and then we, I just started showing them all this new shit that I had accumulated. Yeah. And, um, uh, there was some stuff with a previous project by the lights that, I carried over into the rebel year because I really liked the tunes that I had written. And I, I thought, Hey, you know, mm-hmm. won't, and it won't sound the same cause it was a different style of band. Um, and that's, uh, that's how it happened. Just, just emails and sort of good vibes. And I guess realizing that you're, you're not 25 anymore. You're 35 and that all the stuff you thought was really important when you're 25, maybe it wasn't the, and what, what was the all. timeline of this? How long ago was this? This was in twenty end of twenty sixteen. Okay, I think. and you guys stayed together. Uh, you gelled again. Uh, everything was good. Yeah, we still do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely it's. Um, so we've we've been taking a little bit of a break over the last couple of months, but um, I think it's just a lot more easier. And I'm I'm probably the biggest reason. Like I, I I've always taken music very seriously. It's a, it's a passion of mine, and it maybe drives people away sometimes. Hmm. Um, whereas when the rebel year got back together, the idea was, Hey, if we go a period of like, you know, four or five months of not jamming, we go a period of four or five months and then we pick it back up when we're all, as long as, as long as you got the guys to do it, like you guys took a 10 year fucking break. Yeah. (laughs) Do you feel like the rebel year is going to be around forever? Like, I hope so. What the fuck, right? I hope so. Why yeah, not? why not? Yeah. yeah it's like nothing, you, nothing stopping yeah, us. Yeah, we'll so. take some breaks. We'll do our own thing. But there's always that kind of like back pocket of like, eh, everything's fucking kind of kind of stagnant right now. Yeah. Rebel year. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Let's play a song. Okay. Um, Something current, I guess, from the rebel year. What do you want to sure. hear? Sure. Yeah. So we'll do uh, Common Patterns, it's called. Common Patterns. It was the last song we did. So when we got back together in 2016, I had this... Uh, song that I had written and I showed Dan um, we did like an acoustic jam and it just came together like that and then we brought it to the band and it just came together like that and um, we went in the studio pretty much right away and recorded it in one day and released it so constant patterns common patterns common patterns common pardon patterns. me all right common patterns Cool. All right, we're going to play this song from the Rebel Year, and then we're going to come back with uh, Chris Ward. This is episode 46. This is Ego and Vice.
Hey, we're back. This is episode 46 of Ego and Vice. I'm sitting here with Chris Ward. Hey. Hey. Silent Era Cinema. Yep. What the fuck is that? It's the new project. It's the new solo thing I got on the go. It's, uh, and it's probably the, the most, no, this is going to sound, most different thing I've ever done. Okay. Musically in the 20 years that I've been writing and, and making songs. Awesome. Uh, so first up, it's mostly instrumental, although I do have one new track that I just released that has a, a vocalist on it, but uh, it's mostly instrumental uh, and, you know, it's it's all me by myself at home in my studio, uh, writing the tunes. It's got a lot of synths, a lot of beat making, um, just completely different than anything I've done. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're a songwriter yourself, so you know the usual thing is... You know, you pick up your acoustic, have your pen and paper in hand, write a song out, you know. You don't know me, man. Yeah. You don't know, you totally do. (laughs) Yeah. So, well, and that's been me too, right? Like, for, like, you know, I have lyric books at home and stuff. Um, I wanted to write something. I wanted to start a project where songs were written that weren't intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. Okay. And I wanted to write something where I didn't rely on things like, you know the big hook chorus and i didn't rely on okay i don't have anything here so i'll just i don't know i'll do a breakdown on some other chords like i wanted something where i had to challenge myself um as a songwriter um you know there's no vocal well with the exception of one song you know Mm -hmm. um there's no vocals on any of this stuff so um and i don't i plan on vocals being or I plan on no vocals being the norm. I don't plan on having a lot of singing, you know? Yeah, and man, I appreciate that a lot. For the sole reason is that, you know Matt Luloff from Hearts and Minds, the singer of Hearts yep. and Minds? He has a uh, project called Still Cities, which has okay. the same idea. Yeah. It's instrumental, but it's like sitting in his basement just kind of like creating beats and, and stuff like that. Yep. I, I, I'll send you a link for that. Sure. And maybe you guys can like riff off each other like find Absolutely. some influence from each other but it's very much the same idea and uh yeah i appreciate that a lot because i love his still cities project yeah and i was listening to some of your uh well you have a couple songs out yeah i've got so i've got two releases out uh i put out an ep a four song ep back in april yeah. and now like i guess last friday i put out a two song uh i don't know cool double a side whatever you want to call it right so i always i always i told matt too i said still cities was always like good driving music yeah you know what i mean you put that shit on and you're just like at night with the lights and all that stuff and, yeah uh cool man um what do you want to do with this is this just like a like a hobby or do you want to i don't like, know you've like, been in you've been in you've been in rock bands your whole life yeah yeah so, yeah, so where 100... do you go where do you go from here to be honest i don't know you know it's funny because i don't i don't have i don't have any expectations of it i don't have any i like i guess you know any you know any artist and stuff has goals right that they want to accomplish but um so you know i have goals and i but i think the goals are just hey man just keep writing music you know and if people are digging it then fuck why not just just, keep just getting that out there yeah you know, just get, getting it out of you almost you yeah, know what i mean yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. you know like i, I f- respect that for sure i think one of the biggest things for me with music is it's always been an outlet and I, I look back on the times over the last 20 years where I've maybe not been the happiest. And it's because, you know, it's it's because something has not been going right musically, right? It's usually because I can't write a song. I have a writer's block. And those are when I'm like my crabbiest. Preaching like, to the, preach to the choir, sir. I can't do it, you know. And um, so, you know, with the with the Rebel Year sort of being on, on a break for the last little bit, that creative outlet in me is still there. And I, I still need to... Uh, you know, I need to get it out. I, I can't, I can't, you know, so mm, that's cool, man. That's how I know. I like, I respect that so much. And one thing I've always said about myself is that I've played punk rock my whole life. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is like hit my forties, which I have, <laughs> but all of a sudden go to like some, like a rockabilly acoustic kind of like, yeah. I was born in a shed. Yeah. <laughs> I won't do it. I no, fucking won't do it. And I don't blame it. you, man. And I appreciate when people are in rock bands and they choose 
because we're in a tech, technical tech, technological age mm-hmm. where they take and they make beats and they try and f- do something different. You yeah. know what I mean? Something different from what they've done mm-hmm. and not just pick up that acoustic guitar and turn the distortion off and just write the same kind of shit yeah. just acoustically and turn it into some like weird country fucking babble type of shit. So mm-hmm. I, I respect that a lot. Yeah. And I respect that from Matt and I respect that from you a lot. And yeah. uh, I like your stuff, man. I think it's Thanks. I think it's I think it's really great. It's creative. Yeah. It's like different ideas. It's different sounds you know what i mean to mm-hmm. just kind of put that put that uh that project together and a lot of it is trial and error i have so what i did for the first ep for example was i i would come up with a riff be it on a synth be it on a keyboard be it on or like my piano or be it on a guitar mm-hmm. and just come up with one riff mm-hmm. and then i would if i liked the riff i would actually so i'd go into my recording program i would just pick a random time for the song so when you see a song on the first EP that's like four minutes and 38 seconds, uh, that's because I just randomly picked four minutes and 38 seconds. And I would I would take the one sample of my own work. So it wasn't like boring a sample, no. but I'd, I'd loop my guitar riff and then I go, OK, well, maybe this like synth sounds better on it. OK. And like even for my beats, a lot of the beats that I've come up with, um, I use um like kit samples. So it's not like not like techno beats that I think a lot of people think of like. When you listen to the stuff I'm doing, a lot of it, with the exception of maybe one tune, a lot of it sounds full band. Like it sounds like you know I have a band recording with me, you know, mm-hmm. but it's all me. It's all, you know, it's and it's, you know, I, I considered myself before this project an amateur with recording software, you know, but trial and error, man. So yeah, man. What you're hearing is literally me making a shit ton of mistakes before I get <laughs> the song out. Do you enjoy playing live? I do. I do think you, it's become a little more. Um, do, do you see this new project somehow performing? That is a goal of mine. I think for 2019 okay. is to is to somehow. I haven't figured out how yet because there's just so much shit going on in a lot of these songs. But I would love to figure out how to get it on onto a stage. Whether it would be having like a live drummer or maybe the the drums and the beats stay programmed and. I just have a guitar player and I play keys. Like I, I haven't, I haven't quite figured it out. Cool. We'll see. Like I know there's like a, a there's like a something called Switched On Synths or something at House of Targ once right, a month. Right, right, right. I'd love to try and get a slot on there and just, man, like the rest of it, trial by trial by error. <laughs> let's see. That's how exciting. That's, no, it's yeah, very exciting because it's just yeah. like that's part of the project, right? Let's yeah. just see what we can do with it. Yeah. And. Uh, if, whenever you do that, I will be there, man. I'll, All right, I'll awesome. Come on, I'll come and enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's uh, let's play a song. Okay. What do you want to hear from your? Well, now that I've touted it as a largely instrumental project, let's listen to a song that actually has vocals on it. Okay. <laughs> sure. So, uh, this song is it's just I just uh, put it out last Friday, so it's called Hold, and it's got a uh, great singer. Her name's Crystal Jessup singing the uh, the the. The voice that you hear is Crystal singing. Cool. Do you want to introduce this? Yeah. So this is uh, Hold featuring Crystal Jessup by Silent Era Cinema. Awesome. This is episode 46. This is Eagle and Vice.
Silent Era Cinema. That was fucking rad. Thanks, man. Good for you, dude. Thank you. Um, we're going to do the rapid question <clears throat> period now. You ready? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, go. You must be fuckered, man. Like, what's he talking about? Any questions? All right, Chris Ward. Yep. You son of a bitch. All right, let's this do it. This <laughs> is the rapid question period. Um, the way I do the rapid question period is I have 30 questions that I actually wrote on a, a wrote out on a piece of paper, and I got Chris to um, choose 10 random numbers out of the 30, Yep. and these are the ones he chose, All right. and in no random order. Okay. Or in a random in order. A ran- yeah, in, a random order. in a random order. Okay. Yeah. Question number one. Uh, what is your biggest musical influence? Oh, wow. Um, the Verve. The Verve. Yeah, early Verve. So <clears throat> I love Richard Ashcroft. Don't really like what he's doing now. But um, I always said I got into bands because of Oasis, but I got into songwriting because of the Verve. Love those guys. Very good. Yeah. Uh, question number two. What would ruin your day right now? Hmm. <sighs> If I didn't, if I got a call saying I didn't get this house that that we just I just bought. Oh a yeah, house. you're buying a you're buying <laughs> house. You're buying a house, and it's been it's an been, ordeal. It's been an ordeal. So if they called me back again to tell me that it didn't happen, I think that would absolutely ruin my day. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, question number three: favorite band as of today? Whoa. Hmm. Like, are we thinking rock band, or can just be anything? Anything you want. Hmm. As of today. I'm really into Tycho right now. Tycho? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess, sort of a solo project slash band. And it's in line with what I'm doing with uh, the Silent Era Cinema stuff. Tycho. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, next question. Uh, favorite Sunday afternoon? Watching football. Yeah. Having some Are beer watching football. Some football. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Doing my fantasy football. Cool. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, celebrity you despise and why? Oh, there's so many. Um, James Franco. He's not funny. Hmm? Um, And one time, a friend of mine and I, on a trip to L.A., we saw James Franco. Now, this was a little bit before he, the star he's become. He was filming some movie. I think it was called like Grasshopper or something. And um, in between takes, a pregnant woman went up to him to ask him for an autograph, and he shooed her away. So then my friend and I and some other people at, at the train station at the time, we booed him quite lo- loudly. Booed just, James I, Frank. Oh, I just think that guy's such a pompous ass. Yeah, isn't so. he in some like weird kind of like thing right now for like sexual assault? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, anyway. He just, I mean, there's a lot of celebrities, but you know, if I'm rapid firing this, that's the first thing that came to mind. That's I dig it. Thing. I dig yeah. it. Maybe he deserves it. Fuck that guy. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, what's your favorite song as of today? Um... Well, it's funny, you know, because we're talking about like, like you know, Tycho and sort of instrumental music. But right now, I'm digging I Mother Earth. Remember those guys? Fuck yeah. I don't know what made me think of this tune. So I know everyone's into the Edwin I Mother Earth, but I actually really like the Brian stuff, the okay. stuff that, that he did. They did after Edwin left. So they got back together after some years apart and they released a song called um, Where is the Love or We Have the Love or something like Anyway. I've yeah, I downloaded the song on iTunes the other day and I've I've been listening to it nonstop for days. Cool. I don't know what it is about that. Did time. you ever hear the Edwin like solo stuff? That yeah, was not fucking it. bullshit. Man. I'm not having that, that one. That was the worst fuck anyway. Yeah, no, I'm not having that one at all. All right, next question. Yep. Uh where am I? Uh first concert or show you ever saw? If we if we don't include the uh, punk shows that I used to go to at like Legion Halls and shit in Manatic. Mm-hmm. So if we're talking actual bands, my buddy and I went to see Green Day. It was wow. our first ever concert on the Dookie Tour at the Ottawa Civic Center. Nice. Yeah. That's a good tour. Yeah. Shit, man. That <laughs> was that was like life-changing. That, that was like... Uh, I just burped. Scene-changing. <laughs> yeah. I have to edit that burp out. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway. All right. Next question. Um, Death Row Song. Last song you'd ever listen to right before they pulled the switch. Slide Away by The Verve. Yeah. Verve again, eh? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a theme. Slide here. away by the verve. Okay, we have two questions left okay. for Chris Ward. Um everyone picks 30. I like that. That's cool <laughs> because it's a good ending question. But uh the ninth question is if you had a pet monkey, what would you name him? <laughs> <laughs> um you know what? Let's go with let's go with Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell. Yeah. I have a cat. I have a 
Uh, my wife and I have like a, I think she's 19 pound, a 19 pound cat. That's a big boy. And big girl. Uh, big girl. And uh, her name is Tinkerbell. Hmm. So <laughs> let's just stick with that. All right. I'm not very creative with pet names. And the last question of the rapid question period, episode 46 of Ego and Vice is, as of right now, mm-hmm. what was the best day of your life? I'd say it was when my son was born. Probably split with when my daughter was born. But I think for my, the reason I say my son is just because it was my first child. And I think that's, you know, not that I don't love my daughter. I love her too. But I think, yeah, becoming a dad is a huge thing. So life, if there was one thing that was life changing, it was that. Very good.
So awesome. Um, Chris, it's been awesome. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug as far as what's going on in your uh, crazy, crazy life? Yeah, just just this project, man, Silent Air Cinema. Um, you can find me on Bandcamp, all the, you know, all the websites, right, all the social media stuff. So Bandcamp. Um, uh, what else? Instagram is uh, at, official era, at official Silent Era Cinema. Um, I'm on I'm on Facebook obviously too. Uh, we just uh, I just released all the stuff onto iTunes and Spotify as well. So I'm I've started throwing around some ideas for my third EP and like I was telling you earlier, really want to sort of take this to the live stage. So would love the support right now and then hopefully uh, you know just continues to grow. Yeah, man, and I will support you as much as I can. Just send me some links, send me like what's going on, and I will do my best on Ego and Vice to uh, promote it as much as I can. Thank you very much. Cool, man. Right. If you want to get a hold of me, you can uh, contact me at egoandvice at gmail.com. If you want to listen to any of the podcasts, you can go to egoandvice.com. Uh, I'm available on iTunes, Google Play, uh, Potomatic, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. All the shit that you can actually find uh, cool podcasts. Well, don't don't actually search cool podcast because you might not find mine. Yeah. But as far as episode forty six, Chris Ward, my friend, it's been a pleasure. Same. Thank, thank you, you for, very much. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, I will be back next week uh, with a good friend of mine from Thunder Bay, Ontario, Mr. Gary Doherty. So, tell you what, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker.